even space bar work on the sure. Okay. I'll do the Peter approach. <coughs> All right, uh, this is uh, an extension of a project that I presented at NARCON this year at the R&D session there. Uh, so I'm going to summarize both the, briefly summarize the NARCON stuff and then move into the new stuff that uh, is for this particular project. If you look at the history of uh, piston R&D, there's been lots of reports. Uh, one of the earliest one was by Tripp back in 72. That was looking at what were called closed grease launchers where the entire rocket and fins all sat inside the tube. Uh, his work showed that giant pistons don't work, but then other people developed small diameter pistons. But all the uh, early works uh, implied that short pistons were best, like 10-inch pistons, 12-inch pistons, 7-inch pistons. But more recent work by the Allway uh, team and then uh, Patrick Peterson and the Neutron Fusion said, hey, long pistons are better. So what's the deal? What's the right answer here? So the purpose of both the Narcon report and then the new work here is to say, can we better understand exactly what pistons are doing? Can we come up with analysis techniques that replicate what's in flight? Can we get better flight measurements so we can really understand what's actually going on? The approach that was used for the Narcon uh, was rather than using uh, photography, which most people have used to try to uh, measure a rocket in flight, I used uh, an accelerometer uh, that's on the uh, Raven altimeter board. It's got both a uh, pressure sensor and three axis accelerometers. So I could actually measure the acceleration during the piston phase of flight. Uh, that accelerometer can uh, go up to about 70 G's at 400 Hertz. So you get a fair number of samples during the piston part and you can actually see what the piston is doing. Uh, I also focused at that time on C6 motors, uh, 18 millimeter motors, so um, there's more, that'll get into what the, um, the current work is about. Uh, the findings were that, hey, you can get pretty accurate results if you get really high resolution uh, thrust time curves. Uh, that was done by doing some static testing, and you can see uh, the new static test data for C6 motors compared to historical data presented by uh, NAR s &T. They're very similar, but there has been some evolution of the motors since the data that uh, was published is based on motors and black powder uh, for uh, 1995. But if you use uh, the high resolution data during the initial thrust rise, the analysis techniques are shown here that you can get a really good match between what the analysis would predict, which is the thick line, versus what the flight data actually uh, experienced. So that says, hey, that's great. That's for an 18 millimeter motor and for the size of models being tested there. So I said, hey, let's continue this. Use the same methods, but now extend those to 13 millimeter motors. So I'm looking at both A3 motors and A10 motors. So again, the same methods, we're gonna use that onboard accelerometer to measure the flight. We'll do calculations using the same methodology to predict what's happening, see if those two agree. Uh, to start with, uh, you have to get the high resolution uh, thrust time curves. Here's where life started to get interesting on this project, which is that if you compare a modern A3 motor to a historic data, they're way different. Uh, if there's a lot higher thrust now, higher peak thrust, and a shorter uh, time for an A3 compared to the uh, older data. If you look at A10s, uh, similarly, they've got other differences, uh, on some motors, the peak thrust is lower than the historic data, the burn time's a lot longer. So it's a different motor to a certain extent than it was historically. But if we use that, um, if we plug this new data into the process, then we can go from there. Uh, the same process again, um, we're using the same Raven altimeter. Uh, we are using smaller uh, flight vehicles for 13 uh, for the 18 millimeter motor, I was using stuff that's almost like egg lofter heavy. For A3s, I'm trying to get a model more representative of lighter, smaller models. So I've got two models here. One that I use for all the A3 testing. I have a second model because I had such a really hard time trying to keep the A10 models connected to the piston. The internal pressures during an A10 launch really high. Wants to pop the, the rocket off pretty quick. Uh, so I actually developed a mechanical device to hold the rocket on uh, during the piston operation. 
the mechanical device worked really well to hold it on, not so well about letting go necessarily. So uh, anyway, the piston <laughs> yeah. part of the behavior is good, afterwards uh, not so good. If uh, the first step was to do some reference flights, that's uh, just taking those test models, uh, putting an A3, launching it off uh, through a tower, no piston, using the new uh, static test data. What we're showing here is that the uh, fly results and analysis uh, using open rock with the new uh, thrust time curves are basically dead nuts on. That says that the new static test data is good. Now here, this is comparing the analysis predictions to A3 flights. And here, well, you know, I'm going to call this reasonably good. And the reason I'm saying that is that analysis seems to be under predicting a bit what's going on in the early part of the, um, the piston performance and maybe over predicting towards the end. But we're, we're certainly in the right ballpark, we're in the right G level range. And particularly if you look at the velocity produced by the piston, uh, analysis is predicting for an A3 launch for this particular model, uh, piston velocity of about 21 meters per second. And that's what was seen in flight, that we're getting uh, flight uh, results of, say, roughly 19 to 21 meters per second. So again, we're pretty close. Doing the same thing for an A-10. Uh, this is a reference flight. Uh, again, no piston on this one, just launch out of a tower. Uh, again, the measured flight accelerations match pretty well uh, to just open rock simulation using that static test data. So again, we're in the right ballpark. And here's how we compare to the actual piston launch data. And again, I'll call this moderately good, maybe not reasonably good like the previous one, now we're down to just moderately good. Uh, again, we're in the right ballpark. We've got the right accelerations, uh, but the analysis tends to underpredict the early part. It somewhat overpredicts the uh, later part of this relatively short period of time. Uh, the other thing that was curious is that the A10 motor seemed to have a lot more variation. Uh, these are not necessarily all out of the same batch. I didn't try to get them out of the same batch intentionally to see how they reproduce. But you can have one uh, result where the piston's hot. You can have others where it's not as high performance. Uh, similarly, if you look at the, um, the actual velocity produced by the piston, Analysis is pretty good, you know, it's predicting a piston velocity of almost 32 meters per second at the end of an A10 piston stroke for just a 34 inch piston. So that's some pretty impressive stuff. Uh, analysis, other than that really low motor down there in the bottom, uh, analysis predicting somewhere between, or excuse me, uh, flight uh, was showing roughly 28 meters per second to again about 32 meters per second. So, you know, moderately good agreement. Uh, we're definitely in the right ballpark. It's not dead nuts on the way that the 18 millimeter results. Two minutes. Uh, an interesting thing that was observed in one flight is that because of the really high internal pressure in the piston while it's launching, that may actually affect how the motor performs because uh, thrust, is, uh, thrust time curves are usually generated at ambient pressure. Uh, internal pressure in pistons is up to like three atmospheres. Uh, so that could affect uh, how the motor performs. Um, I can tell you more about that later, but it almost looked like in this one that there was no exhaust flame visible as the rocket was leaving the tube. And it wasn't until like three frames later that you actually saw the rocket exhaust start up. So there could be an effect on the motor performance itself. Uh, the other thing I did on this project is there's a whole lot of things that people sort of slough off uh, or say are negligible trying to look at piston performance. Uh, I was able to show a lot of things actually were negligible and I will refer you to the report uh, to go into that. But things like uh, gas leakage is actually a negligible effect unless you're really dopey. But you don't have to have super tight tolerances or things like that. Uh, a lot of other effects uh, are negligible there. Again, reference you to the report. <coughs> So in summary, uh, really interesting uh, techniques are available now where you can use analysis to, uh, with reasonable accuracy, uh, predict how a piston's gonna behave. You can put different rocket weights mm -hmm. on, you can try different piston sizes, you can try different piston weights, uh, piston lengths. Uh, so you can use this uh, spreadsheet tool 
to try to simulate the piston, if you're really looking for ultimate performance, uh, the, the spreadsheet can go a long way towards uh, pointing you in the right direction. Like 10 minutes or <coughs> Question. <coughs> Do you have any idea why the A10s might have such variation, more variation in performance than the A3s? I don't have any, well I could speculate it at great length, but I don't really have any good ideas. Or I don't have any firm identification of why that would be. Um, they've got a larger diameter throat, it's possible that they're more affected by the back pressure in the piston. I don't really know. Maybe you don't have a, a good example in this report, but I was just fascinated by the accelerometer data mm -hmm. coming off of the piston. And there's sometimes you'd have this thing that'd be a bunch of yep. jerky stuff, and then there'd be another rise. Right. Do you have an example like that in your picture? Can you show me, tell me what's going on during those mm -hmm. times? Um, do you get a second? Yeah, like one of those. Do you get like a second acceleration? Yeah. What's, what's happening? happening exactly? What's happening um, here? So uh, these are all floating head pistons. So what happens is the rocket comes off, picks up the piston head, you now have a sealed uh, chamber, so your acceleration immediately drops to zero, or minus one, depending on if you want to take gravity, you know, how, how you account for gravity, but let's say it drops to zero. So you go from like, you know, 35, 40 Gs down to zero, then the uh, uh, pressure inside the piston builds up, boom, blows the rocket and the, uh, the piston apart. So you get this big spike while you're blowing the two apart. After that, then the rocket just drops down to the uh, thrust time curve, minus so, drag effects. So the rest of that is the normal thrust time curve for the rocket. Right, yeah, this is just uh, the peak of the A3, and then yeah. you go down to the and standard thrust level. Tenths of a second. Right, yeah, there's a lot that happens um, <coughs> while a rocket is separating from a piston, particularly a, a, a floating head piston. You talked about uh, the spreadsheet and some of the theory that went into this. Was that all the stuff you developed, or did you get that from some other? Uh, my work, uh, my spreadsheet is basically based on a program that Jeff Landis wrote a long time ago. Okay. Jeff Landis developed his based on a lot of work that Tripp had done before that. And so, are you planning to make this available? To yes, uh, it's okay. not. Uh, I would call it commercialized yet. You know, I'm not trying to sell it, but it needs to be. Uh, robust enough where the average person is not changing the wrong cells and stuff like that. <laughs> I'd be interested to be able to have that or put it on the website or yeah. something. Yeah, uh, I am really planning so to do that. Right. So just perhaps a, perhaps a little bit of an off-the-wall question to talk about all the things happening, particularly with a floating head piston. Um, if you went retro and went to a fixed head piston, any thoughts as to, I don't know if you gain anything, but would, would um, or would you gain anything? Would it be counterintuitive that, that I I did that because uh, did I miss it in the parade report? I'm sorry. It's I don't know. Uh, I I would have to go back and look at more. I think I actually have one section in there. I only did it once. But what happens on a fixed head piston is the piston comes up, hits the piston at the top, and I got a video if you want to see it. It's really cool. Anyway, it hits the top, rebounds back. Now what happened? What's critical is when it hits that stop. How much friction is it going to take to break the rocket loose? If you have that perfect fit, it just goes on its way. And the one uh, fixed head uh, <coughs> result that I have, instead of seeing all this shock, you know, violent acceleration <coughs> going on, it just goes in, in, in. Just went on its way. So I have the magic fit. The problem with Fixed head pistons is can you get that perfect fit every time so it's not too tight, but otherwise pulling it out when it hits the fixed head is going to be really hard. Uh, the other thing that's interesting is I've been doing a lot of slow, um, sort of high speed videos, the slow mo setting on your iPhone, and there's a lot of times where you think oh, that was a perfect piston launch, and what you find out is it actually left halfway up through the piston stroke. So there's a lot of interesting things that you can see either through. Uh, uh, the accelerate uh, the accelerometer data or through the high speed videos. Thank you. Yes. So did I read this right that these pistons are letting these models push fifty G's? Yes. Uh, I flew egg loft the other day. Uh, I was flying it on sort of standard thirty four inch piston, it goes up, it comes back, uh, lands kinda hard, pull it out, it's cracked in the back. 
from thrust. Right. Wow. Not not in the front. Mm -hmm. uh, in the back. Sure. Uh, how did you mount your accelerometer or your Raven in, in the model? I'm seeing some acceler accelerometer noise. Do you think that might perhaps explain some of the some of the data problems you're having with the higher thrust motors? No, um, well, let's say I don't think so. Uh, what I did is I took the uh, Raven, mounted it on a mounting board, had that board in a tube, and uh, the board actually hit off. It's on a hard stop. It wasn't on a piece of foam or bubble wrap or anything like that. Okay, so you're uh, similarly on the front, on the front the that it was sort of held in place. So I didn't want it rattling or bouncing around as much as possible. Right. Time is up. Time is up. Sorry.